Welcome to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. This is your host, Dr. Linda Bluestein, former ballet dancer, board certified anesthesiologist, specialist in treating hypermobility disorders, and medical director at Wisconsin Integrative Pain Specialists. Today, Jennifer Milner joins me as a guest co host. Jennifer is a certified Pilates trainer specializing in dancers and post injury recoveries. Our guest today is Myra McCormick, physiotherapist for the Royal Ballet in London. Myra has been working for many years as a dance specialist physiotherapist with all age groups and now works part-time to allow PhD studies at University College London. Her interests are hypermobility in dance, classical ballet technique, and reducing the risk of injury in the profession. She has also worked in musical theater and contemporary dance, appreciating all dance genres. Myra was trained at the Royal Ballet School, graduating to the Royal Ballet Company. After a dance career, including National Ballet of Canada and London Festival Ballet, she completed teacher training in classical ballet, working internationally before embarking on a physiotherapy career. Myra lectures for the Master's in Science Program in Sports Medicine and the Master's in Science Program in Performing Arts Medicine at UCL. I would love to know, we have seen um, just in the recent you know, few years, social media has exploded. And as it has kind of solidified itself in the world, do you see audience expectations changing for a dance aesthetic based just because of what they're getting from social media? Well, I think audiences are more demanding now. They do want to see the aesthetic, but they also want to see you know, fabulous, new, challenging, yes. difficult choreography. Mm-hmm. And the, the choreographers are de- now delivering. They're coming up with some of the most exciting, uh, wonderful choreography that when they challenge the dancer with, the dancers love, they, they find it interesting and, and they want to do it. And a lot of the time, it's very positive because if it's well rehearsed, then the dancer goes with it and strengthens Mm -hmm. for, they strengthen in uh, each of those challenges. And so a lot of the time, it is very positive, exciting for the dancers, uh, creative for the dancers, and exciting for the audience. So... A lot of that, I mean, I, I love and, and celebrate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just have to be careful that we do still understand that dancers never say no. They will always <laughs> right. keep going. And they will never say, oh, I did so much yesterday and I'm really quite sore. I think I need to back off a bit today. Well, number one, the ca- choreographer isn't going to understand that. Right. Um, and uh, the dancer hasn't been clever enough to, to say, well, what is my schedule this week? Where can I really push? Where can I pull back? Mm-hmm. You know, and know where those very challenging rehearsals are going to be and save themselves for those and pull back on other things. So dancers will never say no. So they'll go in and go, oh, my God, I will have to do this all over again, just like I did yesterday. And I'm not really up to it, but I'll have to be because the demand is there. And then that's when the strain starts to uh, Mm. set in and they haven't managed to recover from the day before. And that maybe is where the choreographers need to understand that if they organize their rehearsals really well, they can use some dancers some days and some dancers the other days and, and balance it all out because we know that the, the dancer will not look after themselves. And if we want to get that dancer to the first night mm-hmm. at their peak, not over their peak, but at mm-hmm. their peak and get that, the whole thing to come together for that first night, that's when I think choreographers and those people rehearsing the dancers uh, need to really think things through and almost see ahead and protect dancers from uh, overdoing it. Yes. 
because as you said, if someone comes in very sore from Tuesday's rehearsal, well, Tuesday's rehearsal was probably not with the same choreographer that Wednesday's rehearsal will be with. So Wednesday's rehearsal choreographer will say, well, I don't care that you're sore from yesterday. Today's my time with you. I need to work with you. So institutionally taking a look at the schedule and trying to protect the dancer a little more is, is definitely important. Yeah. I mean, it's still hard because it's a creative process and each person taking the particular rehearsal will need a hundred percent. And, and I think that's also where the artistic management have to understand that maybe a hundred percent is just too much every single day. And there are times when a rehearsal could be marked, you know, you could uh, take a breather or when you really have to pull the whole thing together and see what those dancers can do, then it's time for 150%. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, it's either, you know, we say, well, you know, very experienced dancers know how to do this. They're very professional. Mm, I don't actually see evidence of that. Our most devoted and loyal uh, dancers will still go overboard and do too much yes. and regret it. Yes, absolutely, because that's who they are and that's, that's what they want to do and it's hard for them to know how to hold back and, and not give everything that they have. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, the most experienced professionals will, if there's a, a big urgent change in the, in the casting and more rehearsals are required, I've had two instances when, where the principal dancer has been working so hard, they have forgotten to eat and forgotten to hydrate because they've been trying to get it, pull it all together mm. before the performance and they've gone on for the performance and suffered really badly. Mm -hmm. So it happens to the best. <laughs> That's comforting to know <laughs> that it happens to the best of them. Um, so I know we started talking about how social media informed the audience expectations, but it, but it definitely informs the, the young dancers as well. Um, and overstretching and hyper splits and, and incredibly insane positions are all over social media right now. Um, do you have advice for dancers who think that overstretching is the path for better flexibility and for a, a better profile in their professional dance career? Well, you know, watch social media, see what's going on, be in there, know what every, what's being peddled around, but be extremely critical. And if you're unsure of anything, ask your teacher. Uh, discuss it with your teacher, what you've been seeing and ideas that have been uh, promoted on social media. I mean, I, I saw something not so long ago where, oh, dear, it was very distressing. Uh, a dancer was being pushed into, we know that hypermobile knees, hyperextended knees mm -hmm. are difficult to teach, especially with a beautiful foot on the end of a hypermobile uh, leg. It's what lots of dancers want, but it's very difficult to strengthen and very difficult to control and very difficult to teach. And to look at social media and see a professional dancer being pushed into a hyperextended position in her knee, mm -hmm. completely off center. And even the dancer, after she was standing in that position for a very long time with the teacher, uh, she came out of the position and started rubbing her knee because you could see that she was mm -hmm. going to develop anterior impingement of that knee if she was going to stand like that for any length of time at all. And just something like that really does disturb me. And so it's watching those presentations with a great deal of, of criticism. That's all I can say because, you know, it's uncontrollable. You also asked about audiences wanting the aesthetic. Uh, the Vaganova School in St. Petersburg has always selected their students for those perfect aesthetic proportions. So that's been going on in history. Yes. And I think I'm seeing, actually over, over here in Europe, I'm seeing more evidence of it that dancers are being selected for those proportions, you know, the very long legs, the mm -hmm. short trunk, the long mm -hmm. neck. 
small head. Very Balanchine, of course. Yes. Uh, and we're seeing more of it here. But on top of all of that, there's a hypermobility. They want the flexibility as well. Yes. So, you know, you put all of that together, a long leg, a hyperextended knee, a very flexible point position, a very flexible spine. You know, you put that picture together and that is one of the most vulnerable physiques to have to stabilize and strengthen. And so we're really up against it in our, mm-hmm. um, our healthcare teams, try, trying to look after dancers. We're up against it because we have the most vulnerable physiques to deal with and vulnerable uh, physiques who are being asked to do more and more challenging uh, choreography. Yes, yes. And the audience requests what it, what it sees and the choreographers respond and the dancers dig deeper and then it sort of continues to feed itself. So I, yeah. I agree with you completely. Um, I mean, it's not always a bad thing because we're right. creating, it's a, a thing of, you know, fantastic choreography is a thing of beauty and excitement. But we do have to make sure that we give them a, such a, a healthy basis from which to train like that. Yes, absolutely. And I think the healthy basis that we are able to start from now comes from the amount of research that has come out in the past 10 to 20 years on hypermobility and how much we have moved forward in that in dance medicine. And you are absolutely one of the leading researchers. I think I fangirl over your <laughs> your research <laughs> articles when they come out um, because I have learned so much from the work that you have done. You do have a, a nice body of research. Is there is there anything that has surprised you to come out of your research? Anything that you've seen and go, oh, well, that's not what I thought would be the case. Well, you know, I, I'm I am a bit still a bit disappointed in how we're not understanding each other so well, the people in science and in healthcare and the artistic managements and all the ex-dancers who become part of the artistic management, how we still don't, we're not really understanding each other yet. And the dancer, of course, is the one that loses out just because of, you know, workload, recovery, giving the time to cross-train the dancer rather than hours and hours of rehearsal leading straight into uh, performance. We know that uh, we've got to keep on churning out high-level performances, bring in the audiences, make the program throughout the year interesting, novel, exploratory, experimental. So we know that that all has to happen. And it's hard to deliver all of that with dancers who are uh, human beings and cannot function like machines. But I think we, we all understand that. and We're all under certain stress and strain to deliver. But we keep trying. And we keep trying to understand each other. <laughs> That, and, and that's the best that we can do is to try to keep bringing both sides of the table together because it's the dancer that, that both sides are trying to serve ultimately. At least we hope so, yes. right? <laughs> yes. I know that um, yes. <laughs> we have looked a lot at how to, there's been so much conversation about screening dancers for possibility of injury and screening dancers with hypermobility and trying to predict who's going to get injured and what we can do. Do you do regular screening for dancers specifically for hypermobility or is it just something that you can see eyeball wise? Do those screening results change the sort of workload that they would put on or perhaps what levels they would be considered for company wise? Is there a screening like that that goes on? No, we don't, we don't necessarily screen uh, for hypermobility. Our dancers come into the company and they are, the new ones are screened so that we know what past uh, injuries have happened because that's one of the main risks of developing an injury is past injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all young, so age is another predictor of injury, so we don't sure. have that problem. Hypermobility is, so we take that on board. 
And that's the, the initial screen when they come into the company. And they are po- pointed in the direction of what is there to help them. And I like to say it's performance enhancement rather than anything else. Performance <laughs> I say the exact same all, thing. <laughs> it's going to make you dance better. And we know that if they, don't, if they dance better, they're not going to get so injured. Um, so that happens at the beginning. And then we do a yearly screen. And our screening has got smaller and smaller and more precise. There's stuff we want to know. We want to remind them and ourselves of any past injuries. And then we want to know that because we have a tradition in dance, we have a high level of foot and ankle injuries. We want to know that their calf stamina is good enough. And so we, we look at that, all their uh, single leg rises to make sure that they can get a certain number done without fatigue. Our uh, dance scientists in the, the gym will be using, we're very lucky to have a, a force plate. They will be looking at the single leg jump and uh, making sure that both sides are the same. And if they're not, of course, that can immediately be worked on. And then they are videoed doing a single knee bend so that we know that the hip is stable and they do a a single leg hop. And we look at, again, we video the pelvis and the hip to make sure weaknesses aren't creeping in. And so it's quite a small screen, but it's a very good way of bringing the dancers in at the beginning of every year and reconnecting with them, having a chat, knowing what's gone on the year before, and looking at uh, at certain tests. We, of course, know our dancers. They come to the company and they stay for a long time. So we know our dancers very well, Mm -hmm. and we monitor them each year. The same thing goes on at the, the upper school. They are screened every year. They're at the school for three years, so the the screening is well monitored. And from that screen, immediately, they are given the results and they are given the advice of where they need to go to deal with any deficits that have been observed. And the dancers are very cooperative. And we usually start off at the beginning of every season in our end of August with a good positive plan for each dancer. That's fantastic. And it it sounds like such a simple, small, as you said, you've gotten it quite narrowed down to just a few simple screens that can tell you so much and help the dancer feel like you have their best interest at heart and can start the season off so well and, and start off healthy and try to have a plan for the whole year rather than trying to address each issue as it comes up. Mm. That's great. Yes, it's a, it's a good way of us all getting together and they realizing, you know, there's all this at my fingertips to help me be a better dancer. Yes. We spoke a little bit earlier about um, hypermo- young hypermobile dancers and, and sort of how to work with them and, and how to uh, help them start to take care of themselves. We don't often talk about hypermobile dancers later in their career. Is there any advice you give to hypermobile dancers who have had a successful career and how to try to continue on later in their career? Oh, yes, because there's, you know, it's never too late to build something else into your physique, into your body. It doesn't matter how old you are, you can get stronger and you can get very subtly stronger in, in areas that have been a problem for years, an ankle that's been a problem for years, and you've started to just accept that there's an osteochondral defect in there. You know, I saw it on MRI. It's not going to get better. My ankle's a bit sore. Mm-hmm. I can't do this and I can't do that. Keep away from this. Keep away from that. And then I can cope. You know, I can just make it work with the right advice and the right patience, you can put strength into that ankle as long as you, you start to put the strength in it at the right level, which may be very, very low level. But it's, if you put the strength in and just 
certain balanced exercises and then balance exercises in fundu and then balance exercise on a quarter point and then look at again go back to the technique and and look at just how you're closing into fifth is there a little bit of rotation that's mm -hmm. subtle rotation that's going on in that ankle and that's what's actually stopping you from moving on um, I was working with a, an older dancer. I, I work from time to time with her and I learn from her all the time. It's fantastic. And, you know, we've started to get uh, an ankle that's been a problem for years. We've started to get it stronger and she can see the difference and she can feel the difference. And she's performing, doing a lot of performances and starting to feel in control again, not oh, well, I'll just keep away from that. I'll keep away from that and I'll, I will manage. It's, no, I know I can do it now and I know what's going to keep me going and I know what I'll resort to uh, mm -hmm. the next morning. I'll do my exercises, get totally organized before I go into class and then I'll do my class and then afterwards I'll do more strength stuff, really try and load it a bit more and then into my rehearsal. Uh, you know, it's never too late. And That's I do feel as dancers get older, you need to do more and more of that sort of thing, you know, you, to hold it all together because every dancer has accumulated a certain number of, I call them scars <laughs> throughout <laughs> their career. And, you know, they're not, in, nothing's a mystery. Nothing is a mystery. Nothing is insurmountable. Nothing is unmanageable. As long as you, you understand what's going on, and what you can do about it. But I, the bad news is older dancers have to work harder as they, as they get older. <laughs> but it's so, um, it's so encouraging to hear that it's never too late. And for a dancer to know, I have these things, I've lived with them for so long, I'll just see if I can outlast them until I'm ready to retire. But to know, just do something, start somewhere, get help with one thing and then it's this and then it's fixing, fixing your, your closure to fifth and then it's increasing the strength and it, it can feel overwhelming figuring out where to start, but it's, you're absolutely right. It is never, never too late to do that. And it's um, so encouraging when you yes. do go, Oh, you know, that releve is starting to come back. You know, it's so encouraging. It's such a beautiful feeling. Yes. Yes. Um, with uh, dance teachers, you wrote a fantastic paper, I would say, guide, uh, Managing Joint Hypermobility, a guide for dance teachers. Uh, I, I print it out and hand it to pretty much every studio I work with <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's so brilliant, and hopefully we'll have a link to that. But for dance teachers trying to figure out how to work with hypermobile dancers and they don't have access to the large body of dance scientists and dance medicine specialists, do you have advice for those teachers who are really wanting to, to learn more about how to work with those hypermobile dancers? I do feel that the hypermobile, the young dancer, takes a bit longer to understand and get the movement patterns into their bodies because I think the proprioception often isn't as accurate as the as maybe the rest of the class, and they they're a bit of a often a slow at at strengthening and a little bit slower than everyone else, and they'll be slower to go on point. Mm. They they won't be able to manage it the way uh, the 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 stiffer type of ankle can. So I think teachers need to be patient and say it's going to take longer. And I'm this one's, and they're always worth looking after because you know, I think as a dance teacher, if you're putting stability into a hypermobile body, it's going to benefit them in every part of their lives. So, you know, it's, it's uh, a huge benefit to give a, give a child an understanding of stability and alignment uh, and therefore protection of the joints. So I would say for a dance teacher, it's, it is being absolutely demanding of perfect alignment at all times. 
keeping legs low and going for control rather than range, going for proximal stability, trunk stability, pelvic stability, and that control of the hip. If it's ballet they're, they're uh, working in, then it's get that control of, of turnout. Do not go for the range and a perfect first or fifth, even if the child can actually achieve that, they won't be able to achieve it dynamically and they won't be able, you know, in, in movement, they won't be able to. So keep it all very conservative and well aligned and look after those young feet. It will pay off in the end. I mean, there's nothing different. We, we demand that from every child in a ballet class, but particularly the hypermobile ones who, who lack proprioception and, and, and sort of innate stability. So I would go for understand the body and have maybe have a good idea of the connective tissue, stretchiness of the connective tissue, but also have a good idea of the morphology of the joints, the, the shape of the joints. Uh, if you know you can find a hypermobile physique that has a limited amount of external rotation in the hip, a limited turnout in the hip, just because it's a uh, it's not a shallow joint, it's deep and it's you know not that flexible. Whereas the rest of the body can be very right. flexible. So you've got to understand that physique, and make mm. sure you know as much about it as you can. I know that goes for every physique in your class, but it is the hypermobile ones that tend to fail first if they're allowed to uh, work without perfect control. Right, and to, to be allowed to kind of go unchecked. And I think that, um, I know that for me personally, I, I've seen way more hypermobile dancers and dancers with connective tissue disorders like, like EDS since I have started working with pre-professional and, and adolescent dancers in the professional realm, uh, working with New York City Ballet and such, I just didn't see as many of them. And I have noticed that there's more in a younger age, partly because they, there's a, a, an attrition, a natural attrition, injury-wise and aches and pains-wise and that kind of thing. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think I would. It's just that I'm, you know, I don't see as many uh, and you are seeing far more uh, adolescent dancers than I am. And so I would definitely go along with that. Uh, and that's why I'm not, con- I don't sort of, I can't really comment the way you can. Sure. Well, you listed some really concrete um, points for teachers looking to work with hypermobility, talking about keep the legs low, be able to control your range, um, hip proximal stability, Teachers need to understand the body and understand the connective tissue and the shape of the joints. And I loved what you said about how dynamic achievement is different than a static achievement and and being able to educate the dancers on that. And in the U.S., we have competition schools that I don't think are quite as popular in the U.K., but we see a fair amount of, of schools that see more of the pictures in their head, trying to come up with these beautiful pictures on the dance floor and these, these images that will wow the judges and things that will make the judges say yes and give them the trophy and the awards. Um, so a lot of times we see that the more ethical teachers or, or maybe the more conservative teachers may not do as well in the competitions because they're not pushing their kids into those, those end ranges. So have, do you have competition schools in the UK? Is it as big? Um, do you see those same kind of issues? There are, there are a few competitions, but we're, us Brits, we're not very competition. <laughs> <laughs> really. And so, you know, um, we're, not, we're not so out there. And I think it's very sad when you do see uh, wonderful talent being pushed into unrealistic positions and, and all of that, because more often than not, you won't be seeing them again because yes, they right. will wear themselves out and they'll fail. And the basis, the really strong basis has not been put in there in the technique to give them a springing point up into the career. 
so when that when that basis is not there you know we we will fail we do in the raw ballet company have and the school we have competition winners electing for their prize to come to the Royal Ballet School yes. or um, to come as a, a young student joiner in the company. And they often need a lot of sorting out. Mm. They will need to be almost retaught. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So that is one of the things that we, the one of our great strengths in the company and in the school is to be able to give a, a dancer who needs technical sorting out a one-to-one regular class. So the the dancer is taken through with a coach and every, the technique is broken right down and they are replaced and it's all explained to them why they're being replaced mm. and uh, what the theory is behind it so that they can go back into normal class and use all those theories and understand them. That, I feel, is terribly important. And I, I was chatting with one of the coaches the other day saying, I'd love every dancer in the company to go into a one-to-one once a month and just do a little revisit to, because everyone has technical problems, everyone has stuff that needs sorting out or they have questions about, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, but just to go back to the basics and to revisit a few things. And that opportunity is there in our company uh, and anyone can take, take mm. them up on it. But mostly that one-to-one is, is uh, rehabbing after, after injury. Yes, but wouldn't it be great if it happened before injury? Yes. <laughs> so that there was no injury. Like. Just, yes. Yeah. Yes. Just once a month, let's just have a little technique check. Yes. Well, and it sounds like you're saying um, that a lot of times, and, and there are some lovely competition schools out there, so I don't mean to paint them all with the same brush, but a lot of times schools, whether they're competition or ballet, because there's competition in the ballet world as well, might perhaps even unknowingly be sacrificing technique for the aesthetic, for trying to get that certain, that certain look. And that going back and breaking the technique back down and getting back to basics may be the key to preventing injury or even coming back from, from an injury as well. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. And I'm not knocking competition schools or competitions. Right. either because for a young dancer to get up on a stage and do something really difficult in front of a huge audience um, is a wonderful experience and it's uh, it's something you take with you into your into your career and it gives you that extra confidence to to say well I, I've already done this I've already been up there it's just that we would like to have it we'd like all that to be done with with great care and understanding Absolutely. Absolutely. And subtlety. So if parents are, are looking to find a school and, and they're looking at social media and these teams have won a lot and this company or this school has a lot of students in here, they can take some of that into account. But since a lot of places don't have that access to the, the dance medicine and dance science team like Royal Ballet does, what advice would you give to parents trying to choose a school? How can they try to find a school that will help them with that and kind of have that well-roundedness to their approach? A school that does provide health care, of course, is um, a school that realizes the, the importance. Of course, And absolutely. a school that will push a certain amount of finance in that direction means it's a school that's actually thought things through in a very realistic way. Because we know that, especially in um, full-time classical ballet training, dancers get injured. It's, it is just part of it. And we can talk about prevention, pretty impossible. We can talk about uh, reduction, that's more realistic, reduction of injury. But dancers will suffer at some point. Uh, and so if the school that your uh, child is electing to go to does not have uh, a healthcare department, at least align yourself with uh, a local physiotherapist who comes recommended and you know that you can refer to for advice, health checks, and maybe screening. uh, If you, if you think, you know, yearly, that'd be a good idea. And 
uh, at least have uh, the advice from a, a, a recommended professional. Yes, that's great. That's a great place to start. You have written a book, Anatomy, Dance, Technique, and Injury Prevention, which is now in its fourth edition. Um, was there anything specific that led you to write this book and, and to want to get that information out there? Well, first of all, it was uh, Justin House who started this, that, that book off. I was involved in the last two editions. Okay. And um, Justin was a wonderful orthopedic surgeon who worked with the Royal Ballet School for many, many years, and I worked with him for many years. He was actually the the doctor who did my first screen before I was accepted into the Royal Ballet School. So he knew me as a student, and then he uh, knew me as a, a physiotherapist. Then we worked together. Um, I loved the idea of technique and injury prevention. It was first of all written to allow teachers to access a little bit more about injuries and uh, diagnosis and ways of treating, and less so for students. I think students don't think about injuries until they've actually experienced injuries, and also for physiotherapists who are working in dance for the first time. It's a good Mm. way to dip in and learn a bit about a technique. It's quite an old book. It's not peer reviewed, you know, all of those things, but it is one of its kind. It will need updating definitely at some point, Um, but it's a useful book. And uh, I I loved working on it uh, with Justin. That's great. And we are, we are grateful for books like that for sure. (laughs) So, are you, what are you hoping to dig in deeper into next? You had mentioned you're doing part-time work with Royal Ballet to have more time for research. What is coming up and, and what sort of studies do you think are, are most important for the future? What are you looking to have happen next in the, in the ballet research world? Well, as you know, with a PhD, you tend to get microscopically involved with things and you can't change the world either. So my, uh, what I'm concentrating at the moment on is uh, looking at screening tests and looking at how mm. reliable they are, because we all do them, but we don't right. know how reliable they are. <laughs> uh, you know, it's inter-rater, inter-tester reliability or intra-tester reliability. We don't mm-hmm. actually know. And, you know, we see so many papers coming out where the test was done, this is what we got, This was the basis of our research. And really you're going, did you actually look at reliability? Can we really trust you, Um, trust the rest of your research because you didn't look at the reliability? So I'm doing that at the moment. I, the first part of my research was actually looking at uh, what, well, the type of physiques that are being selected into the profession. And that's where I discovered that all the artistic people wanted flexibility and proportion and beautiful feet. Beautiful Mm. feet came up (laughs) all the time, as well as small head and long neck. Right. Which my supervisors found very amusing. And I went, (laughs) it's not amusing, it's fact. Just go and look. (laughs) <laughs> and they have, they have, and they go, oh, you're right. So <laughs> all that aesthetic stuff was coming, was being demanded and chosen by our artistic uh, management and all our physiotherapists and doctors and strength trainers and Pilates trainers. They were wanting strength, stability, stamina, And we weren't actually seeing along the the same lines. So that was was interesting up to a point. I think we could have predicted all of that. And then I am moving through my screening tests to, I'd I'd like to look at more to do with injury prevention in the hypermobile physique. Mm. I don't know if it's going to be part of my PhD or whether it will come post, but we'll see. Well, whenever it comes, we will be grateful for it. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) 
Is there, is there anything else you wanted to add to what we've talked about today? And also, where can people find you and find out more about your work? Well, I can always be contacted through Royal Ballet Company. I think I'm probably contactable through University College London on our website of the, where I'm working is the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, part of UCL. So if anyone has questions, I'll, I, I can do my best. That's awesome. Fabulous. Well, this is such a great conversation. I know I, know I certainly <laughs> learned a lot and I know that our, our listeners will be just thrilled to, to get the information. So thank you so much, Moira McCormick, for coming on the program today. And Jennifer Milner, thank you so much for being uh, a guest co-host today on, uh, on the show. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it was uh, lovely to meet you, Jennifer, which we haven't actually met. And uh, <laughs> Linda and I will be meeting in New Orleans, won't we? Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Yes, and, and on the um, PAMA conference. Yes. Right, right, most definitely. And it's been great having everybody um, here today for Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. Today, our guest has been Moira McCormick, physiotherapist for the Royal Ballet Company in London. And please go to bendybodies.org for links to more information. We will have uh, links there to where you can get more information about the different research projects that Moira has done and um, things for dance teachers, for parents, etc., and, and dancers themselves. Please go to bendybodies.org for links to all the episodes and to access the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share, leave a review, and consider rating us five stars. Don't forget to subscribe so you will be notified of all new episodes. Feedback is greatly appreciated and can be emailed to bendybodiespodcast at gmail.com. Go to hypermobilitymd.com to sign up for my newsletter. My guest co-host, Jennifer Milner, can be reached at jennifer at jennifer-milner.com. That's M-I-L-N-E-R. Thank you to Rhett Gill for production and sound editing, to Andrew Savino for composing our original music, and to Jennifer Arsenault for designing the Bendy Bodies website and cover artwork. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Please see your own medical team prior to making any changes to your health care. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD.